just a, uh, another just quick background on uh, Terra Verde Energy. Um, you'll see that we have a couple different logos. We recently changed our name from Terra Verde Renewable Partners to Terra Verde Energy because well, in our early years, we were focused specifically on solar and then battery storage. Uh, in recent years, we've gotten more involved in energy efficiency, uh, EV buses, um, and distributed energy resource programs for uh, community choice aggregation agencies. So we're now Terra Verde Energy. We've been around for 10 years. Uh, we've done a lot of work at schools, some work at uh, cities and other municipalities, a lot of work at um, water resource agencies, water agencies, and transit agencies. Um, just one other brief introductory piece is that with me today is Ali Shahrazaz, who is our Executive Vice President of Engineering. Uh, so while we're going to be talking about commercial issues and policy issues for the most part, uh, we will be talking a little bit about some technical issues. And so if as part of the Q&A process, if we get into some more detailed technical issues, Ali will be jumping in and, and providing some, some feedback. And in that regard, um, just feel free to use the chat function on the uh, on the uh, webinar page on that page on the right and just um, you know type in your question uh, I'll stop at various points to to answer questions so feel free to just jump in with that at any point and and we'll address those questions and then we'll do a, a general Q&A at the end um, uh, uh, of the, the presentation um, and just one other point I think Carrie has sent out a copy of these slides, but if for some reason you didn't get one, just cycle back with him and he can get you a copy of these slides uh, for your information. And, and if you have other specific questions, I have my contact information at the end. We can get you other material as needed. All right, enough with uh, the introductions. Um, so the purpose of the webinar is basically to, as it says here, describe the changing policy and market conditions and evolving technologies impacting energy and to take a look at what are some of the opportunities for public energy public agencies to generate cost savings, new revenues, and meet their uh, sustainability and climate goal, uh, climate policy goals? Um, you know, just a little bit of context here. You know, there have been there have been a lot of changes, and they seem to be accelerating in the policy and market arenas. Uh, and while this can be confusing, it also can be and somewhat complex. Uh, for an energy manager or somebody who's involved in uh, dealing with cost issues and policy issues at the public agency level, it, it definitely increases the opportunities for folks who want to control their energy or transportation costs and or improve their sustainability profile. Uh, so for example, while solar does continue to provide meaningful cost savings for many public agencies, a number of recent changes in how solar energy is credited by the incumbent utilities and growing number of um, community choice agencies are making it a more uh, difficult uh, process to figure out where those savings are gonna come from and how they're gonna occur. Uh, for example, uh, new utility time of use TOU rate schedules really do require careful examination of whether or not projects are financially feasible. Uh, We'll talk a little bit more detail about that later. Uh, and and in, in some cases, it makes sense uh, to pair battery storage uh, with solar to offset the accelerating growth in demand charges, that part of the bill that involves your demand. Uh, sometimes standalone battery storage, even on its own, uh, makes sense, sometimes paired with solar. But that takes a, a more detailed uh, engineering financial analysis to determine that. Um, another area that is coming into the fore, uh, unfortunately for uh, in some cases tragic reasons, is uh, pairing solar plus storage with microgrid controls to become better prepared for what seem to be increasing numbers of natural disasters uh, that result in grid outages. Um, and then finally, and this gets to the, the, the sort of general overview piece of this, the macro level, which is that as the, the state is having to come to terms with the need to modernize the grid to accommodate all these new sources of clean energy, um, it, it, it looks like solar storage and other smart energy devices known as distributed energy resources will soon be able to 
participate uh, in grid modernization markets that are looking at what are called non-wire alternatives uh, as a way of generating additional revenues on top of the savings that you might get uh, by offsetting your energy usage. So a lot of different things are in the mix and we'll try to cover as many of them uh, today and in the second part of the series uh, in March. So let's start with solar uh, and what the current situation is. I, I, I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, one of the big, big changes that's happening now is what's called the TOU or time of use shift. One of the things that historically made solar a very good financial alternative is that solar produces electricity or has historically produced electricity at the time when the charges for electricity, the peak period, was the greatest, the afternoon. But because of the proliferation of solar in California, that peak period, the period when the supply demand imbalance is the greatest, has now shifted to the evening. And so uh, the utilities in California have convinced the California Public Utilities Commission to now move that peak period to the four to nine period rather than during the afternoon. And that has therefore degraded the value of uh, new solar projects because you're not offsetting uh, as effectively your most expensive part of your bill. Um, now there have been, uh, there is a, there's grandfathering provisions that have been part of these policy changes that make sure that those folks who made investments for their agencies uh, over the last, you know, five or so years are still going to get the benefit of the current peak periods. Um, the, the way the rule is set up is from the time at which a current solar project is put into effect, uh, what's known as PTO or permission to operate, they have up to 10 years of having their credits be generated through the current peak period in the afternoon, that time of use period in the afternoon, or 2027, whichever is earlier. Um, after that point, uh, they will have to go to the new time of use periods, and therefore, you know, as a result, the, the credits that they get will be degraded, assuming that, again, their greatest load is also during that afternoon period, which is the, 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 the general case for most, most projects. Um, there was an opportunity to get in under this grandfathering uh, in the late fall. Uh, there, there was a short period when public agencies and public agencies alone were able to apply for this grandfathering going forward, but that cutoff was on December 31st. So at this point, those shifts are going to likely occur uh, for PG&E territory uh, in uh, early 2020, uh, for Edison territory uh, in uh, early 2019, and uh, for SDG&E later this year. Um, and so if you, even if you haven't thought about solar, what is important is if you're not aware that these shifts are going to be taking place, uh, it could, even if you don't have solar, it could affect uh, your cost of energy, depending on what your operational model is. And so it's something to, to take a look at. And we've been asked by a number of different public agencies to run uh, you know, projections on what that impact is going to be on their bills. So that's something you're interested in. You can let us know. On the other side, um, as more and more communities are moving into these uh, community choice aggregation agencies, uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Many of these community choice agencies, uh, if you switch over to getting your power from them, uh, are, are providing slightly more beneficial uh, net metering rules around the provision of solar uh, than what the incumbent utility was providing. Uh, and so it's, if you already have a solar project or you're, you're having one under development, you want to take a look at what the benefits would be in the context of the policies of the CCA that you might be a part of versus your incumbent utility. Uh, the general practice has been that under the CCA, there's about a, a, a penny per kilowatt hour better uh, uh, um, financial incentive than what the utility would provide. There's some where it's less than that. And in some cases, there are new CCAs that are forming that are potentially, they put proposals out on the street that would have that be close to two cents a kilowatt hour better. So if you're in a community where a CCA is either underway or in consideration and you have solar, 
you might want to look at it through that lens. It's important to look at it. In terms of the commercial area, uh, one of the big issues that we're, fate, we're, we're dealing with is that many public agencies implemented solar with you know, uh, all the good intentions in the world, uh, hoping and believing that uh, they would be able to manage them fairly easily and without a whole lot of attention. And for the most part, when properly designed and properly constructed, solar projects are going to perform as expected, but it doesn't mean that you can't, it doesn't mean that you have to completely ignore it. And we've had, for example, a recent transit agency come to us and say, we're not sure how our project that we put in 11 years ago is performing because our bills seem to be higher than we thought they were going to be. Well, we went in and did a physical inspection of their solar and it turned out that half of the panels weren't even generating electricity because the inverter had shut down uh, uh, over nine months ago and they weren't even aware of it. Uh, now that's, that's a horror story, but the point is there is some level of asset management, uh, which includes both monitoring, uh, reporting, and the physical uh, inspection and, uh, and maintenance that needs to happen in order to get the most value out of these systems. And so if you don't have an active asset management plan in place, uh, it's something that you really want to be able to be uh, taking a look at. The other piece is that, uh, you know, as public agencies, uh, your policy uh, oversight, your governing board, whoever that may be, uh, occasionally wants to know how these projects are performing. And it is important to get out in front of that. And part of that is having a way to actually look at what is your uh, energy bill today with your solar project versus what it would have been if you hadn't put in solar. And that can be a bit of a complex uh, analysis, but there are a number of uh, you know, firms out there that provide that. That's something that we do, but there are a number of other firms that are out there that provide that. And it is, uh, we think, a, a best practice to make sure that there is that performance performance reporting that's going on. Uh, the third main commercial issue I want to talk about is market consolidation. Um, as opposed to 10 years ago when the, the sort of beginning of the most recent solar boom occurred, uh, there are very, there are much smaller number of reputable uh, uh, firms that can provide uh, either construction services or PPAs or whatever than there were that, that period a long time ago. And with that consolidation, uh, there's some positives to that is that, you know, some of the more marginal players are no longer in the system. Uh, the negative is that there's less competition, which means that in terms of, you know, pricing, uh, you have to be much more savvy about how you uh, do your procurement in solar and making sure that you're getting the best of that competitive market. Uh, so, you know, one of the one of the, the, the problems that, that public agencies sometimes run into is that because under, under what's known as government code 4217, energy projects can be procured through a sole source arrangement, which can be beneficial, but um, a, a number of agencies have gotten into trouble because they didn't understand the complexity of the projects themselves and, and just went down the path of doing a sole source procurement and later on found out that they really left value and money and risk on the table that they might have been able to get away from if they'd done something uh, in a more formal competitive process. And uh, so with market consolidation, you need to pay attention to that question a little bit more, uh, a little more closely. And the last piece I'll talk about in terms of the current situation with solar is, um, you know, the cost issue, which is, it is the case that over time, uh, the cost per watt, which is the sort of single most commonly used metric for, for understanding the cost of solar project, has come down significantly. And that's mostly a matter of economy of scale. Uh, as, as the uh, increase in the market uh, for solar has, has occurred, uh, the manufacturing uh, world has responded to that and and brought the prices of solar panels down, uh, you know, significantly over the last 10 years. Not quite uh, as in parallel as Moore's law with computer chips, but but definitely at a very high rate. 
Um, we'll talk a little bit later about uh, the most recent uh, tariff issue associated with um, a trade case uh, that's impacting those costs. But, uh, but in general, the, the trend has been downward. That said, we've gotten to a point now where the cost of providing electricity through solar is equal to or less than fossil fuel-based energy. And so the pressure to bring those costs down even more is going to start to uh, go away. And so our expectations around the cost going down at that same rate, uh, there is a point at which, you know, it's not going to go. <laughs> and, and so, uh, you know, there are some folks who may be saying, well, I'm going to wait a few more years. I'm going to wait a few more years. It's going to get cheaper and cheaper. Those big cost reductions, uh, we don't see anything in the pipeline from a technological standpoint uh, that's going to make that big a difference because, frankly, we're at a point now where the cost of the equipment itself is marginally significantly less. It's the labor cost uh, that is the greater part of the cost of these projects. And there's not a whole lot that technology is going to do to change those labor costs. Uh, so, um, you know, important to be recognizing that we're getting to that where uh, the, the cost is not driven down that much further. I'm going to talk a little bit about what's coming up in solar, and then I'll, I'll open it for some uh, some questions. Uh, the big the big policy change that's going to likely be coming forward is we is the rules around net metering. Uh, we had a net metering 1.0, which lasted till about uh, a year and a half, two years ago. Uh, net metering 2.0 uh, essentially brought down the value of the credits that one gets from solar. Uh, by changes in the various rules uh, by about 20 to 25 percent. Uh, now that was offset by again the reduced cost of solar. So in terms of the impact financially, it, it has been a bit of a wash over the last couple of years. But we're now starting, uh, the CPUC is going to be starting a process soon called net metering 3.0 and that's going to go into a whole new area. And this is what I was referring to earlier around the use of solar and other devices for grid uh, purposes, for grid modernization purposes. Uh, NEM 3.0 is projected, the scoping of that is projected to be looking at not just the value that solar can bring to you as a customer in offsetting or reducing your cost of electricity. What 3.0 is gonna be looking at is how does the location and uh, other uh, capabilities that a solar project and a solar project governed by an inverter and potentially paired with storage, what kind of benefits can it bring to the management of the grid? Uh, let me give you a very, you know, kind of gross example. Uh, about a year and a half ago, PG&E announced that they were canceling a $143 million uh, grid modernization project, a transmission project, uh, in the greater Fresno area. And the reason that they said they were canceling that project, which would have been paid for by all of us ratepayers, uh, the reason they were canceling that project is because of the growth of quote unquote distributed energy resources in the greater Fresno area, specifically distributed generation solar or solar behind the meter. And they quoted a number of metrics in terms of how much the growth of solar had occurred, et cetera, et cetera. Well, this was reported in the Fresno Bee, and about a day after that article appeared, a couple of superintendents from school districts that we have helped implement solar projects said, so Rick, you, what I get from this article is that the solar projects that we put into place at our schools have helped ratepayers by helping them avoid these costs of these transmission upgrades. And I said, yep, you have done that. And they said, well, what am I going to get paid? For? What am I going to get my check? For doing that. Well, I said, unfortunately, you're not going to get a check because under the current rules, you don't get that benefit that you've provided. You're, you don't get paid for the benefit that you've provided. We're under NEM 3.0. Uh, the expectation is that some of those benefits will accrue to folks who put in solar. Now, what will come with that, though, is that those folks who are implementing solar in locations where that solar doesn't necessarily provide that benefit, they're not going to get that. And they may get even less benefit in terms of the credits they get in offsetting their, 
their usage. So it's not going to be a level. The point being, it's not going to be a level playing fee, fee, uh, field going forward. There are going to be some projects that have higher value and are going to get higher benefits under these policies than others, given their location. And the, and the, the, the common term now is locational benefits of solar uh, that are going to be there. The second important policy development in terms of what's coming up is what's known as DAC or Disadvantaged Community Preferences and Programs. Um, the, the way in which and how the community that's served, depending on its uh, level of disadvantage, uh, will also likely be impacting the benefits that accrue to these projects. Uh, there are a number of different pilots that are out there right now uh, that are being organized to figure out how do we monetize or provide benefits to folks who put in solar in communities that are classified as disadvantaged. And the, the main um, tool that's being used is uh, what's known as the EnviroScreen, uh, otherwise known as EnviroScreen 3.0, which looks at every community in the state across a number of factors Poverty, of course, being one of them, but also uh, environmental issues in terms of air quality uh, uh, and or, um, you know, proximity to, um, uh, you know, Superfund sites, et cetera. So, you know, if you're going to be going forward and looking at implementing projects uh, in the solar area, you want to know what parts of your community have that highest score on that enviro screen in terms of uh, being disadvantaged. And then the third main policy area, which you know I alluded to earlier, is the federal government's uh, uh, ITC or Inter International Trade uh, Commission case, where uh, in January uh, the president decided to, to slap tariffs, uh, additional costs on imported solar panels from certain areas, primarily uh, targeting China. Um, there's been a lot of rhetoric about what the impact of that's going to be. But um, I will tell you right now, our position is that uh, the, uh, the impact of some of the changes in California around time of use period, uh, the net metering rule changes have had and will be having significantly greater impact on the financial viability of solar projects than this ITC ruling. For the point that I made earlier, which is that the biggest cost of a commercial project, which is what we categorize those as projects that public agencies enter into, the biggest cost is not the solar panels. Uh, it's the labor costs uh, and obviously the cost of the money itself. And uh, the incremental impact of this tariff, if you are going to be impacted by it uh, as a specific project, is really only in the three to five percent range of total cost of the project uh, for the typical uh, public agency project. So that's not really as big a deal as I know a lot of the rhetoric has put out there. Now for, for utility scale projects uh, that may or may not, uh, you know, have as where, where the ratio of the cost of the panels is greater uh, than, than in these behind the meter solar projects at, at public agency facilities, that impact will be greater and it will have uh, a more significant impact on the cost of wholesale electricity that's procured that way. But for behind the meter projects, not so much. In terms of the commercial issues, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we do believe that uh, this the, the movement towards seeing these solar projects as being a non-wire alternative to much more expensive grid modernization approaches using hard wires and substations and expensive capital equipment, this is going to create some new revenue streams, uh, what's known as the value stack uh, for these projects. But again, it will be somewhat locationally determined. Uh, the rules on these uh, uh, and the market conditions are still uh, underway. We don't have, there's various pilot projects, but we don't have a stable and clear market signal yet on all this. But we do expect those to become more and more real uh, in the next uh, year or two. And, and frankly, we are working with a couple of CCAs under a California Energy Commission grant and a National Renewable Energy Lab grant to put together uh, analytic tools that will allow both CCAs but any public agency 
to better project what the revenue opportunities might be uh, under these new DER or distributed energy resource programs. One of the things that's going to be enabling this uh, is the move towards what are called smart inverters, meaning the device that sits between your solar project and the grid uh, that does a number of different functions, uh, but, but as of this fall, all new inverters have to have this capability of two-way communication that allow you to do dispatchability, to be able to determine uh, not, not just whether that power that you're generating with that, that solar project benefits you as the building owner or the, uh, the facility owner, uh, but also can be used by the grid operator uh, who can then take control of that and use it in these new ways to support these non-wire alternative needs and approaches to grid management. So uh, while the while solar projects and solar th that had inverters that were installed prior to this fall don't have that, that capability, uh, the technology providers, the inverter providers are telling us that they have the capability to either put in new circuit boards or do new programming in these older inverters to make them smart inverters. Uh, but it's something that, you know, we'll see that that's the promise. We'll see what the, the reality is as we go forward. Uh, as these opportunities come forward. But any new projects from this point on have to have this capability. Uh, and so that's an important development uh, in the technology. So let me take a quick pause. We've, we've, we've only gone through solar and I've taken a half an hour here. Let me see if there are any specific questions. If you could type them into the, uh, the chat board, hopefully it'll show up here um, and, and I, can, I can address those. So I'll just take a couple seconds to let folks put in their questions. Well, I'm not seeing anything showing up. So I don't know if it's a technology problem or folks are still mulling things over. So I'm gonna keep moving forward, but feel free to, to put questions. Let me go to the next slide, which it will allow me to do, there we go, uh, which is battery storage. Um, so, I'm going to start with some basics because I'm not sure that everybody is on the same page in terms of their understanding. But in the last two or three years, uh, the rules were finally established. The market started gearing up to allow facility owners uh, to implement storage either paired with solar or on a standalone basis to help manage uh, the increasing acceleration of the cost, the demand charge cost of your bill. Uh, and in most cases, your demand charge uh, is set by the one 15 minute interval in any month where you have the highest peak usage, peak load. And while solar can offset that uh, by reducing your demand during the periods when solar is producing, uh, which is that you know afternoon period, uh, there are some facilities where their peak is earlier than what solar can offset or later than what solar can offset. And or because solar is not 100% reliable, uh, an inverter can go out, have a little hiccup for 30 or 40 seconds, uh, or uh, you know, a cloud can go over at some point at which the solar uh, production goes down. And that peak occurs, and that if that peak occurs during that time, you're hit with that demand charge. Well, by putting batteries in, you have a backup to your solar to make sure you can shave that demand. Uh, or uh, during times when the solar isn't producing, it can be doing that shaving of that demand. Uh, and while it doesn't financially pencil in every case, uh, there are many cases where uh, particularly facilities that are in you know, uh, areas that use a lot of AC, uh, the Inland Empire, uh, the Central Valley, uh, and, and they're really having to crank during that two to four o'clock period. Uh, having a battery on top of solar or standalone can significantly reduce those demand charges. And just to be clear, over the last five years, and we project this going forward, the way that the various rate structures are going to be coming down from the utilities is to put a higher proportion of their cost recovery 
into the demand charges versus your volumetric electricity use charges. And so we do see batteries as being uh, you know, much more uh, financially viable. Again, we see those costs is coming down, although we haven't gotten to that sweet spot yet where there's enough economies of scale to see the kind of steep price reductions that we saw in the mid 2000s, you know, 2012 to 2016. But we, we are hopeful that that will be occurring uh, over the next few years. Um, well, some of the policy issues are SB 2868 is one where the utilities themselves uh, will be able to actually uh, provide uh, a, uh, a model where they can pay for batteries behind the meter or in front of the meter for public agencies uh, and share in the benefits. Uh, that, that policy is still under uh, review and being developed by the CPUC. Um, there are also, again, I'll just you know repeat that uh, recent policies uh, are being developed and uh, to allow for what are called multiple uses of batteries, where they can be used for again this demand shaving, but also for the kind of grid services that I was mentioning earlier. Uh, and again, the batteries are seen as a much more viable uh, use for grid services because they can be used at all times of the day, uh, morning, afternoon, evening, and nighttime, as opposed to solar, which only has that capability, uh, you know, in the 11 to 4 or 5, 5.30 period. So we do see, uh, our, you know, requests for offer. We do see, you know, greater acceleration of programs that will allow for revenues uh, for those folks uh, to, to get benefits, not just from their demand savings, but from those grid services. And the third important policy area is what's known as the SGIF program, which is stands for Self-Generation Incentive Program, which is the state-sponsored program that provides incentives for implementation of batteries. Um, the, this program has had a bit of a murky history. Uh, it's had a lot of stop and start. There was actually last year a 14-month gap uh, in the program because of some administration issues. Uh, but the program is now seems to be moving along pretty well, uh, and it is a program that where the incentive goes down over time as increased battery capacity is out there. So if you are thinking about doing battery storage, uh, again, we're in a bit of a sweet spot right now where the incentives are pretty generous, the cost of batteries are coming down. Uh, it's a good time to be taking a look at getting into battery storage because of the combination of those incentives and those benefits. I'm not going to beat up on it, but the same commercial issue that we see in solar, we see in battery storage, uh, part of the, in terms of asset management. And part of the problem there is that, uh, it, you know, we're, we're managing uh, a lot of battery storage at a lot of different sites. And the problem right now is that the utilities haven't yet got their accounting systems set up uh, in a um, robust enough way that we're finding mistakes and uh, in, in the credits that they're giving customers in their bills. And so having somebody who's actively managing uh, the billing part of battery storage is really important probably for a few more years until the utilities get their act together on this. Uh, and there's also a lag, uh, which is because a lot of the systems they have right now are still manual, they're not automated. Uh, there's a significant, we're seeing a significant lag in some cases on the credits that folks are getting for uh, shaving those demand charges. Um, so having a good asset management program is really important there. And in terms of the business model, the key point I want to talk about here is that uh, just as in solar, you don't have to actually own uh, a solar facility to get the benefits. You can use the power purchase agreement model where a third party owns and operates the solar facility and sells you the power at a discount to what you might get from your utility. There's a similar type model in battery storage. Uh, it has different names, but essentially it becomes a shared savings model uh, where a third party owns and operates the battery uh, and you get some share of that benefit uh, by being willing to host it there. And as these grid service revenues are coming into place, it's really important that if you enter into a contract under one of these shared services, or power energy agreements or whatever the latest acronym is, 
you got to make sure that your contract allows for and requires you to get not just the demand savings that we've talked about, but that you also get to participate in any revenues that are generated because that third party has the opportunity to sell that battery capacity into those grid services markets. So that's an important commercial issue to stay on top of. Um, the only technology issue I will uh, call out right now is, whereas with solar, you can get very precise about sizing your solar to optimize the benefit in terms of your particular usage or load profile, with battery storage, it's not quite so granular. The sizes are not always standardized and they don't come in very small increments. Uh, so again, doing the analysis to figure out how much battery do you need to get the best economic benefit, um, you have to be, you, you have to use some expert engineering judgment to, to get to that sizing because again, it's a little bit more complex than solar uh, and, and, and there isn't the same degree of standardization around those markets as of yet. Look forward. Um, one of the key issues around this incentive program that's come up recently is that part of the basis for the battery incentive program is that batteries would actually reduce greenhouse gases uh, associated with, uh, you know, energy use at a facility. Uh, the most recent study commissioned by the CPUC, however, found that uh, the smaller the size of the battery, the less likely that it had a, um, a positive GHG impact. Uh, and so uh, there's a, a working group underway as we speak trying to figure out how do we change the rules, uh, you know, change some of the technology requirements to make sure that these state dollars are going towards uh, investments that do in fact impact uh, GHGs in the proper way. And the second issue here, multiple use applications. Again, uh, I mentioned to this earlier, uh, this is this notion that you can use batteries for different purposes and, and get different values. Now, again, it's a little more complex than that. Uh, there, are, there are the ability to use the batteries to support uh, you know, uh, local, very localized uh, uh, distribution grid needs. Uh, when aggregated with batteries across a wide territory, which by the way, public agencies are very well positioned to do because public agencies have multiple sites where they can locate these assets. Uh, they can even be aggregated to support some transmission level grid uh, needs. Um, uh, so again, that process, uh, you know, a set of proposed uh, regulations have come out. Uh, they're under review and are likely to be finalized in the next few months. And that's going to really expand the market because, the, you know, that new set of revenue streams is going to, um, you know, create more opportunities than exist just for the demand purposes that we've talked about earlier. And by the way, for those of you who may have batteries already in place, uh, this is now the time to start talking to your battery provider about how you can participate in these markets uh, with your existing uh, battery projects. Um, the big question is, you know, are, at what point do we get to a level of demand for these this technology that the manufacturing world and the capital world invests in manufacturing capacity to continue to drive the pricing down here? Uh, as I said earlier, we haven't quite gotten to that magic moment, but we do see that coming in the next year or two because we're not only seeing demand for batteries in terms of building use, uh, because of the growth of electric vehicles, uh, where the technology is essentially the same. Uh, some of you engineers may say, what are you talking about, Rick? But basically, it's the same uh, stuff, uh, different software and different application. But that our hope is that those market demands will get, get us into that cycle where we see pricing coming down uh, at a much significantly, you know, an increasing rate. And there are some new technologies uh, that are coming to bear other than what's currently the, the, the primary standard, which is the lithium ion technology that, again, are still in their early stages, but if they do play out, could also drive pricing down uh, and, and lead to that market transformation. Um, we have the same technology issues around uh, smart inverters that I mentioned earlier, so I won't, I won't dig into that. 
Uh, but one of the issues is when we move into this world where now the grid and the grid operators are using batteries uh, to manage congestion and other needs on the grid, uh, there become these, uh, you know, security, cybersecurity issues. Uh, and uh, we are, we, we've had our own experience uh, with a project where we were on, I would call the bleeding edge, where we had to spend a lot of time uh, and, and actually put a lot of political pressure on the local utility uh, because they wanted to require under a project that we spend, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, to put in a system that met what they perceived as their telemetry and security needs. Uh, over time, we were able to negotiate them down from hundreds of thousands of dollars to tens of thousands of dollars, which then made the project a more feasible one. Uh, but but that this issue is not yet settled in terms of what level of security uh, is going to be need to be built into these systems. Uh, and if the cost is too high, then it is going to serve as a barrier to uh, batteries being used in these grid services areas. So we're, we're negotiating and working with industry groups uh, and with policymakers to try to get to a good place there. Keep jamming forward here because uh, you know we have uh, we'll have a little bit of time at the end, but I want to make sure we have plenty of time to talk about the the community choice aggregation issue. And the reason we have community choice aggregation uh, in this presentation about clean energy is because not just because these clean uh, these CCAs um, these agencies have a more aggressive uh, policy framework around clean energy and having a higher proportion of clean energy in the mix that they provide. It's also because we believe that community choice aggregation agencies are uniquely well positioned to become the providers and aggregators of solar and storage and other distributed energy resources in a way that allows them to offset these very high distribution and transmission upgrades that are coming down the pike. And let me take a step back for a second to talk a little bit more about that. Um, when we move, and as we've moved in California from a very centralized model where we have power plants around the state, but a small number of power plants in locations that are very predictable and, in, and with, with production profiles and so forth that are very predictable. M managing the grid was complex, but nowhere near the complexity that you have when you have hundreds of thousands of solar projects spread around the state and uh, many more utility scale projects and wind projects and now battery storage projects around the state. The grid management becomes a much more complex issue. And that with that complexity comes cost. Well, you know, the biggest part of your electricity bill is not your what's called T and D part of your bill or transmission and distribution part of your bill. That that part of your bill is relatively small today. But if some of the costs that are being projected for modernizing the grid to accommodate all these what are known as intermittent sources of, of electricity, of clean energy, come to bear. Uh, <laughs> You're going to start seeing uh, that T and D cost getting greater and greater, and and potentially overwhelming the cost of buying the electricity itself. Well, that's where these non-wire alternatives or distributed energy resource NWAs comes into play. Because what what many of us believe is that rather than having to spend 150 to as much as 300 billion dollars over the next five to 10 years to modernize the grid which is if you extrapolate what the utilities are projecting, um, you can do that for 25 to 30% of that cost. You can do it for more like 60 billion. Uh, and and that, that is a big dollar cost that we would like to try to avoid. Well, how do you do that? Um, we believe that community choice agencies are in a very unique position to go to their customers and say, We'll provide you X, Y, or Z incentive 
if you put in a battery or a solar project or a smart thermostat or other or a smart water heater uh, or a smart you know uh, electric heating device or cooling device such that we can control those devices with your permission in such a way as to provide services to the grid at a significantly lower cost than what this hardwired future might bring. Uh, and so we are working with, uh, as I mentioned earlier, two projects, one with uh, MCE Clean Energy, which is the CCA in the North Bay, uh, covering Marin County, Napa County, uh, City of Benicia, and big chunks of Contra Costa County, to come up with uh, some, some tools that would allow the CCA to identify what are those accounts in which locations where putting in these DERs would have the greatest benefit in terms of these grid modernization and grid uh, non-wire altern alternatives. Um, to the extent that some of the projections around the growth of CCAs occur, which is that some are saying that by 2020, anywhere from 50 to 75% of all account holders in California will be under a CCA. Uh, if that really comes to fruition, uh, we're in a situation where they have that scale that would allow them to provide those resources and those services. Uh, and so we think it's extremely important to our clean energy future in California and to have a grid that is able to be managed at a lower cost for somebody to play that role. Now it's possible that the big battery and solar providers of the world will be those aggregators, the Teslas, the STEMs, the green charge networks, uh, the sun runs, the, the sun powers. They could be the commercial entities that do that aggregation, bypassing uh, the CCAs. But we believe that in terms of public benefit, uh, the CCAs are well positioned and better positioned to do that. And that's why we are working with uh, you know, the CEC grant with MCE Clean Energy and with uh, the National Renewable Energy Lab uh, is funding us to do a, uh, a similar kind of project around rate design that would incentivize these kinds of projects for Peninsula Clean Energy, which serves San Mateo County, and Lancaster Choice Energy, which serves the city of Lancaster, Pico Rivera, and, uh, and a growing number of cities in Southern California. Uh, and, and we'll be doing this with other CCAs as we go along. So, you know, the only thing that might get in the way of that is that um, the, uh, how do I put this? The CPUC, the California Public Energy, Public Utility Commission, uh, is very nervous about whether or not this wholesale takeover of electricity services from the incumbent utilities to these publicly governed agencies. Uh, again, CCAs are all public agencies. They're JPAs of cities and counties uh, at this point. Uh, and, and they have elected governing boards. But the CPC is nervous about whether or not they're going to uh, do the job in a way that meets broader state goals around greenhouse gas uh, reduction, uh, broader state goals around you know, being providing fair rates to all customers uh, and, and, and being in a position to provide uh, the resources, uh, the electricity resources in a way that doesn't lead to uh, market disruptions and some of the kinds of uh, problems that occurred during the early 2000s when a, uh, another effort to change the market through deregulation sort of hit the wall with the whole Enron crisis. So one, what's next? Um, the CPUC is definitely uh, putting out rules that are providing greater oversight and control of what CCAs can do. Uh, they recently passed a uh, resolution that puts requirements on uh, CCAs around uh, how they do procurement of electricity to serve their customers, uh, to meet certain kinds of standards and what are known as resource adequacy meaning that they have plenty of power when it's needed. Uh, there was a lot of pushing back and forth around whether they had the statutory authority to do this, but for the moment, they've taken that, uh, that position. Uh, there's something called uh, the PCIA, 
which is essentially a charge that is put on every CCA customer because of the fact that when a customer goes to a CCA, rather than being with their covered utility, the utility argues that there are uh, investments that the utility has made, contracts that it has signed to provide energy that are now stranded. And so that customer needs to pay for the fact that they've left the customers who are still in that utility holding a cost uh, that they shouldn't have to do. Um, and so there's a lot of battling back and forth around how to calculate what that uh, charge should be to those CCA customers. Uh, and depending on where that comes out, it may, you know, will lead to whether or not the CCAs can continue to provide what they have historically, which is a discount on power of anywhere from two to 5% of, from their your incumbent utility and at a higher proportion of clean energy. Um, so you need to stay tuned to that battle uh, because it is, it is gonna be crucial to the business model of CCAs. Um, I think that's pretty much what I wanted to cover today. Uh, I do see that uh, we have some questions, so I'm going to, I'm going to, um, Carrie, I'm going to ask you to read out the questions because I see your note to me, but I am not seeing the questions in my bar here. So uh, let's, right. uh, let's jump to that. No problem. We have a few minutes left, but let's see if we can get through all these questions. We have quite a few. Um, so going back to your earlier slides, um, can you talk a little bit about the expected impacts of the new tariffs, uh, tariffs on the price of solar? Are they expected to go up or stay about the same as a result of those changes? Yeah, our, our current, but you know, just to put it real simply, right now, you know, uh, panels are in the 40 to 50 cent per watt range. Uh, for most commercial projects, uh, your total all-in cost, because you've got prevailing wage for public agencies, which increases the overall cost of projects. Um, that 40 cents is anywhere from uh, 30 to maybe 40 percent of the total project cost. So if the tariff is 30 percent, well you discount that by another 30 percent. Uh, you discount that by the fact that you know there are different ways in which uh, providers are provide you know putting these projects together we don't think it's going to impact the cost of projects much more than three to five percent, either on a cost basis okay. or on a PPA basis. Okay. And this is and, for uh, public agency. This is for public agency projects, not residential, not utility scale, not business projects. It has to do with the the, the ratio of overall labor costs to overall project costs versus panel costs. And and for public agencies, you have the highest cost of labor costs because of prevailing wage requirements in California. Okay. Now, in a similar vein, as far as the NEM 3.0 and the pairing of solar uh, with battery um, at, you know, specific locations, um, if you were to, is that value of that location going to devalue over time um, and its ability to support the grid? So picking a location today, would that be less valuable in, say, 10 years? Ali, you want to take a shot at that one? So, yeah, that's a opportunity that's evolving we're playing a role in, in I guess, pushing the agenda to create a more transparent process for public sector entities to be able to identify if they are at a location that's valuable so they can have more insight to it. As it is right now, it is the process is more known to the utilities and also to the um, financing entities and third-party companies that own and operate the batteries. So, for example, in uh, Southern California Edison, there is the program called the SCE uh, Locational Capacity Requirement (LCR), and that one uh, provides um, basically demand response uh, incentives to owners of battery systems that can respond their battery systems by discharging them when the utility makes a request. And how long are those contracts for? Um, those are, so here's, here's the, actually what's the interesting part about it. The schools, water agencies, the public sector entities that are actually um, 
involved in these transactions are not necessarily seeing the uh, direct um, involvement of, of these transactions. That's being managed by uh, the entity that's installing these batteries and owns and operates them and, and the utility. So the site host, so a school, a high school or a water agency or whoever uh, engages in an agreement directly with the installer that you know, could be uh, Tesla or STEM or uh, any of these other players. And they bake those benefits that uh, they project they will be receiving uh, by operating these batteries over a 10 year life cycle into the proposal that they provide to you. So in order for you to see if you're getting the most value uh, from that program by SCE, it would be a lot of uh, reverse engineering math that has to be done to see, okay, what's the additional benefit I'm getting that's getting baked into the lease price or the, uh, you know, the, whatever the contract it is that you have with this installer. So let me make it, that's really good detail, but let me, let me say it real simple, a little more simply. Uh, this is the engineer versus the policy guy, but it's important to understand that complexity. The way in which these contracts are currently being set up for these kinds of programs is that the, the provider of the technology is getting the benefit and they're passing that on to you through your contract. So whatever contract term you have, be it a 10 year contract for a battery or a 20 year contract for solar plus battery, whatever it is, you're gonna get that benefit baked into your overall project. You're not gonna be taking the risk essentially as to whether or not the, the um, transaction between that provider and the utility is gonna be repeated or not. The provider is taking that risk. So if they can only get a five-year contract with Edison, for example, on this LCR, um, they're going to bake that into the benefit that they give you. You're not going to, and they're going to make the bet that after five years, they're going to be able to put that resource into the next program or the next market or whatever. Now, for the, my, my assumption is that there are going to be a wider range of choices around who takes what risk where around contract term just as that occurred uh, uh, as the solar market got more mature. But today, as Ali says, it's all behind the contract with the provider that you have. And what we do with our clients is to the extent that they want to take on more of that risk, we push the envelope in those contracts around how much of that benefit is made available to the client. So it, it, it is an, an evolving market, let's put it that way. Hopefully, hopefully that was clear. If, if you want to follow up with us, uh, whoever put this question forward, we'll be glad to get into it with you. Go ahead, Kerry. What's the next question? Uh, thanks, Rick. Uh, we're coming up short of time, so I'll try to get a few more. And if we don't cover them, I'll, I'll send these over to you, Rick. Okay. Uh, and then we can and share we'll... it out in a follow-up email uh, with some yep. answers to some of these questions. But uh, the next question would be, um, is there a CPC ruling or state regulation, uh, regulations actually requiring the new inverters to have two-way communication? Yes. So it's part of the rule one process. Yes. Okay. Went into effect and then, in October, Ali, or early November. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then as far as the ITC, do you expect any, um, any additional changes to that? The, the investment tax credit, I believe you're referring to? Oh, so there's two different ITCs. There's, there's the investment tax credit and then there's the uh, International Trade Commission. Uh, both have the same acronym, and I, that confuses people. It's the International okay. Trade Commission that led to the tariffs that are being proposed to increase the cost of panels imported from China and some other countries. I see. The investment okay. tax credit, that ITC, those rules were pretty much baked uh, in a budget agreement between the Republican Congress and the Obama administration a couple years ago. And uh, we have 30% tax credit through the end of 2019, and then it goes down to 20% the next year, and then 10% the, the following year, and then it's 10% ongoing. Okay. Uh, we're a little bit over, but I think these two questions are pretty important. Um, so, 
Um, as far as critical facilities, in some cases, they're required to mandate, you know, a certain number of hours uh, for backup power in the case of an yes. outage. Um, yes. Is replacing these generators for critical facilities an appropriate use and value of batteries? Absolutely. Uh, we. It's interesting you mentioned. I ju we just got the thumbs up from a school district where we had helped them implement uh, solar a couple of years ago. Uh, to uh, it's their it's their operations facility where they have their IT and they have their phones, they have their bus transportation, and they have their refrigeration for food. And it went out three times last year. And it, for one of those outages, uh, their diesel generator didn't didn't have enough fuel for whatever reason to keep things going and that put them into a, a, a nasty situation. So um, we are going to be putting in batteries on top of the solar. The batteries will provide economic benefits for 99.9% .9 of the time when the grid is operating properly with this demand saving and other uh, benefits. And then for those times when, uh, you know, there's an outage, uh, the microgrid controller and other devices that are being put in Will allow them to island uh, that facility from the grid and continue to operate uh, those critical services. Uh, so, if you're interested in that, uh, definitely something we can we can talk to you about. Um, again, this is a very early stage in terms of the uh, you know deployment of microgrids, but we're going to be seeing a major growth in that. And we're going to talk about microgrids at the next workshop uh, in March. So, stay tuned for that. But if you want to talk to us beforehand. Um, my contact information here in the slides that we'll send out. You have one more, Carrie, and then I think we'll let folks go. Yeah, we'll be, uh, I know their time is valuable, so we'll go with this last question and then uh, send out response uh, for the other questions. So um, today you kind of, we talked quite a bit about local governments, but um, how, how would a municipal utility um, maybe include some of these in their work? Well, if they uh, own the they own the power lines and right. do all that business. Uh, I I would if there's anybody here who's with a municipal utility, I would you know very much uh, want to have you take a look at uh, your your own grid management issues, your distribution grid management issues, and look at some of these applications, these DER non wire alternative uh, solutions as a lower cost alternative. Uh, than the traditional model. That that would be uh, very important. Uh, and and um, again, that's that's something that uh, you know I, I will just refer you to. Certainly, can come talk to us. But one of the one of the uh, you know municipal utilities that's that we've uh, we're aware of is is making a lot of investment in this is uh, Sacramento utility municipal utility district SMUD. Uh, they they are they are a leader in that, and a lot they've been they've done a lot of research and testing and piloting <coughs> of these models, and are 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 promulgating the kind of policies that will be promoting uh, these alternative approaches. So uh, please feel free to to reach out to us uh, or to to SMUD directly um, because uh, they're doing some great stuff there. Excellent. Well, uh, thank you very much, Rick. I think this is really informative. There's a lot of information here. Um, I'm sure everybody, or I hope that everybody uh, had some value in this. It sounds like we had a lot of questions, so um, I think we did. So um, I'd just like to thank everybody um, for, you know, for taking time out of your day, and I hope this was useful. Um, and thank you, Rick, um, and your colleague as well. Um, this is really great. So we'll see you guys on March 20th. We'll send a follow-up email for those last few questions. Um, and go ahead and share the slides once again in case you didn't receive them the first time this afternoon. Um, and we'll look forward to seeing you guys all again. Thanks, Carrie, and thanks everybody for attending. All right. Have a good one, everybody. I know. <laughs>